first question, of course, is um, what is an e-book? And obviously, um, most people are well aware of what that is now. A book-length publication in digital form consisting of text, images, or both. It's produced on, published through, and readable on computers and other electronic devices. And sometimes, or often, they're created just by keying in from a print text, um, but uh, other times they're scanned in, OCR recognition, or increasingly um, e-books are born digital. And just listening to what Alison had to say yesterday, um, that's an exciting field where, where authors are taking control. Um, and the history is surprising, really, because the history of e-books extends over 40 years. Hard to believe, but the first e-book was produced in 1971 by Michael Hart, and that was the um, Declaration of Independence, and uh, that was the precursor to Project Gutenberg. So there's quite a, I've just put a few things on that slide, but there's quite a lot of dates that are reasonably significant. In, in 1992-93, the first e-book reader was created, and they called it Insipit, but it was a um, it was a, a thesis project, so that didn't go anywhere. Um, in 1992, uh, uh, the 1st ebooks went on to CD-ROM. They were produced that way and available. In 1995, Amazon started selling um, physical books on the internet. In 1996, Project Gutenberg reached 1,000 titles, and that took, what, 25 years to reach that 1,000 mark. And, of course, ever since, it's just um, moved on in leaps and bounds, and they um, achieve figures like that in no time at all. Um, in 1998, the first ISBN was was um, associated with an e-book. Uh, the first e-book readers started coming out in 1998. The so I think some of us old timers will remember the old Rocket book and the, the Soft book that um, got marketed. But it was later in the 90s that in the in the in 2000, sort of from about 2007 on, that there was those proliferation of e-books coming left, right, and centre, and one's always trying to outdo the other, and so on. Um, I can remember quite vividly. I can't believe it was in 2000 that Stephen King offered his first his uh, writing the bullet, um, a high-profile author who decided that he would make um, a title that he wrote available in digital form only, which was was something very new. Um, Random House in 2002 and HarperCollins started to sell digital versions of their titles. And in 2004, Google announced that they would digitise uh, library holdings, and it wasn't long in 2005 when uh, they ran into legal difficulties when they had uh, scanned and digitised books that actually weren't out of copyright, and so you'll be aware of a lot of the legal um, history that's gone down in the years to come. Um, Amazon launched Kindle in uh, the US in 2007, and that just is amazing, really, how many versions of Kindle have come out, or new ones just come out uh, in recent days in the US, the Kindle Fire, which is a really good um, competition for the Apple iPad, a lot cheaper. Amazon, um, and then Adobe and Sony agreed to share their readers and uh, their DRM, DRM a bit in the, in the future. Barnes & Noble released the Nook in the US, and that's got quite a market share. Apple releases the iPad and their iBook software. And in 2010, you can see from 2000 on, it's just been just so um, vibrant, the market and, and the, the movement in, in the e-book environment. In 2010, Amazon reports that e-book sales outnumbered the sales of hardcover books. And in 2011, they announced that ebook sales exceed all print sales. And I mean, I could say something today that's not right because the, um, the environment's just changing so quickly. Day to day, you read an article, a newspaper, or whatever that's doing something you've, you've thought at the time on their head, on its head. So, in, um, some interesting facts with the growth of, of ebooks. And the US market obviously is the market that has forged away and it's well ahead of all the other markets. And as we speak in 2011, 82% of public libraries in the US offer e-books. I think probably we're getting quite close in um, New Zealand with the, uh, with the launch of the um, South Island downloadable zone and also the other two consortia approaches in the North Island. We've had e-books offered um, by Wellington, Auckland and Christchurch for three or four years now. 
but with these consortia setups, we're going to find that most libraries in New Zealand are, uh, can offer ebooks. 95% of um, academic libraries in the states offer ebooks, and increasingly, or about this time, public libraries are offering about uh, using about 8% of their total collection budgets um, for the purchase of ebooks, and academic libraries near 20%. So the largest collection is, is Amazon, and in the UK, where the where the growth has been slow, but is really picking up now, um, they've found that my age group, I suppose, the baby boomers, the over 50s, they're really um, a big uptake on e-books. Uh, they're loving the format and the devices, and I suppose they've got really cash to to investigate it all. And most um, the popular readers in the UK are Kindle by quite a margin, um, over iPad and Sony. And we'll find in New Zealand too that um, Kindle's going to be a, a, something that well, 40 years, but it's going to continue to be bought a lot over the Christmas period because it's been hard marketed. And the unfortunate thing is that Kindle, of course, doesn't work with um, public library offerings of e-books. So um, I'll, just, I'll just talk about a few layers of complexity associated with e-books. Um, e-books come out, they're produced in in a variety of formats, and um, four of them are Moby Pocket and Topaz, which are compatible with Kindle, and um, EPUB and PDF, which are becoming more and more the uh, standard, the market standard. So sometimes when you are thinking, why can't I use Kindle, um, or why why can't I use um, a certain uh, e-book with a certain device? Um, it's because certain devices are created to only work with certain file formats. Now, another layer that complicates things a lot more is um, something called DRM, Digital Rights Management. And these are schemes that are produced by publishers and um, distributors in order to protect their rights. Um, that's why there's so much volatility in the market. I mean, they're the the twisting and turning, they're, they're wondering, you know, if they allow this, what impact that will have on their power and I suppose their, their finances. And so um, they're able to limit what, what um, readers can do with, with their files. So there are four schemes. One, um, there might be more, but the four I've read about is um, from Amazon, from Adobe, from Apple and from Barnes & Noble. And DRM schemes allow um, these people to limit how their books can be used in terms of stopping printing, stopping transfer of them, stopping um, the amount of loans that they can they can um, have. For example, HarperCollins, they, you all will be familiar, they came out with a 26 loan limit, which outraged libraries. And in fact, although we will have access, um, I get on further to what, what public libraries are doing, certainly Dunedin, we will have access probably to Harper Collins titles, but we won't um, we won't offer them to our patrons until such time as they um, take that limit off. So it's a, it's a sort of boycott. I have heard that they are thinking about it. Um, and so, and again, the um, they embed what what uh, devices can read different files and so on. So there are a lot of issues for libraries and for people in general. The lack of standards of hardware and software. Um, and for example, if you're if you're downloading a um, an ebook into a laptop or a PC, you've got to use um, some software which is Adobe Digital Editions. If you're downloading into um, any sort of Apple project product, you've got to use um, Bluefire Reader. There are others, Microsoft Reader, there's a whole range of them, um, and that's the, that's the key really, um, just going through the minefield of what matches what and what you can use with what. So um, that's a frustration to all users across the world, whether they're public library users or, or just general users. But, as, but once you get your own, um, your own device, which increasingly more people are, they're becoming um, more aware of where they can get uh, titles without the hassle. Um, availability of titles. Now, you'll be aware that Wheelers, I'll talk about them a bit later, but Wheelers um, have launched an e-book service in 2010 and they've come from nowhere. 
um, and competing with the likes of Overdrive and other ebook services. It sort of had a bit to do with Paul talking about how he's gone about um, achieving the uh, titles that he has, he is able to offer. And of course he has to um, create or, or have signed agreements, contracts with every publisher um, that, that he wishes to offer their products. And um, he has to negotiate those agreements in terms of the geographic region, in terms of New Zealand, able to sell them there. And also, um, and he has to uh, renew those contracts, although they do roll over, but they roll over every year, and, uh, and they'll go, they'll, that's fine, but a, a publisher could at any time rescind the, the rights to, to his ability to distribute those books. Um, he has been in the process of um, scouring a type of, you know, the um, New Zealand Australasian market for publishers that will sign with him. And he's recently gone to the Frankfurt Book Fair where he's um, signed up another 70 publishers, which is increasing his stable of offerings. And I think he's up around the 100,000 title mark um, before Christmas. Um, it's not to say that uh, you'll log on and just see all the latest titles that you want and that, that's the case with every um, ebook provider. A lot of the titles that, that Wheelers will offer are already offered by Overdrive and other, and other um, distributors um, they're, because they're all getting, um, they're not getting single rights to the, to the um, distribution of the titles, they're just getting rights that other, in most cases, that other distributors have. Um, and one of the key things to remember is that Macmillan, Hachette and Simon Schuster do not, um, have not signed off e-rights to any um, distributor as I understand it today. <laughs> that might change. Um, in the e-book version it's a bit like the old days of the paperback coming out sort of so much so much time past the uh, hardcover and that's the case with e-books. It's a frustration, you can't always get them when they've come out in physical form. Um, for libraries, the purchasing models are really interesting, and I'll, when I talk about some of the um, some of the vendors that we could potentially use, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the the purchasing models. But they're a minefield; they're hard to get your head around. What will suit each library best? This is a line from Helen's presentation: non-linear versus linear lending models. Do you want to talk to that? Um, mainly, this is around simultaneous use. How many times you can use a title? Um, who can use it at one time and things like that. So there's all these different models um, how you lend out uh, titles. The different platforms, um, each with their own DRM, which I referred to previously, and another, um, another line of Helen's which she'll take up when she talks about uh, e-books in the academic world. So I was casting around because in New Zealand as a public library person, really all you hear about is Overdrive and, and recently Wheelers. And I was just casting around to, hear, to see what else was on, you know, who else offered um, e-books to public libraries. Just before I get on to this one, I know that Bennett's in Australia has an e-book offering. I haven't explored that, I'd have to say. And when um, Net Library, which was owned by uh, OCLC, transferred to EBSCO um, a year or two ago, they, I know they do have offerings for public libraries, but um, when I talked to them recently, they uh, really haven't got that up and running too much yet. There's not a lot on offer, and they certainly do want to extend that, uh, particularly in terms of fiction. So I didn't delve in any further. And the other one I just wanted to mention, even though Belinda doesn't offer e-books at the moment, they're an audio book um, vendor. They have been for over a year actually saying we're going to get into e-books in the next few months, and they haven't yet, but I'm pretty sure they will. Um, they are, their model is quite interesting in that they, they for audio books, and I'll just mention it because it's sort of an adjunct to um, the likes of Overdrive that offers both e-books and audio books. Um, Belinda's got about 1,600 titles. They don't have to worry about rights because they're their own um, audio titles, and you can buy them in sort of clumps. It's quite an expensive option, and they have a significant administration fee. But you can purchase all at once um, the administration fee and the clump of titles in all at once. But, you know, 
one payment, we can spread that cost over three years, which does make it quite, a, quite a, um, attractive to the likes of a public library like Dunedin Public Libraries. So we may look at a look at, um, at that. So getting on to eBrewery, e e it's an American company and it's uh, the, the preferred vendor of Yankee Book Peddler. And um, they have an offering for lots of different sectors, but they have one specifically for the public libraries. And um, they've got interesting models. Um, you can you can have a clump of titles which the, you then pay an ongoing subscription for. Um, you can purchase to own. You can um, you can have a clump of titles that you only purchase if patrons become interested, and it drives um, patron driven acquisition, which I'll leave to Helen because that's a, that's a, a big um, movement in the academic sector, not so much in public libraries. And then they also offer short-term loans, so you'll get a clump of titles and you're able to loan um, loan to borrowers between one and seven days and pay. They, and the library pays 10 to 15 percent of the, of the print price to allow a short-term loan. You can have up to three short-term loans, at which point it triggers a purchase. Um, if you purchase to own, you pay 150% of the, of the print price. So that's an interesting, um, interesting set of models for us. Now this is interesting, and a lot of you in the room are obviously with the Otago South and um, Public Libraries, and South Island Unloadable Zone was launched about uh, six weeks, eight weeks ago, <clears throat> which incorporates 12 libraries from around the South Island. I haven't got a good idea of how many patrons that actually serves. It would be well over half a million, I would expect. Um, Dunedin and Oamaru have not um, joined. I don't think Timaru has either. Um, because those libraries are investigating the Wheelers option. But um, it's a very attractive page. Um, the image obviously is classic Central Otago, um, but, the, but the layout and style is pure overdrive. And overdrive um, do have a huge number of public libraries and other libraries throughout the world. They're probably the largest e-book distributor in the public sector anyway. Um, and so, being very clever, I um, phoned Invercargill and got a membership number because the Otago South and libraries uh, have reciprocal membership and so although it doesn't work perfectly in terms of physical resources because you actually have to go to the library and join and then if you take something out from them you've got to take it back to them so that can be, it can be a bit of a chore but in terms of digital resources it's absolutely fabulous um, and so I went into um, into the South Island downloadable zone and I um, nominated in Cargill as the library and then I put in my membership number and then it flicked me through and I was able to download, um, what was it, Leslie Pierce Stolen um, and I did this on my PC at home and I first of all had to download Adobe Digital Editions which was pretty easy, it took about two minutes. And then once you download Adobe Digital Editions, you need to then sign up as, um, with Adobe. It's a one-time signing up and it allows you to use up to six um, different devices anywhere um, to access uh, e-books. And obviously here, there's audio books as well. And Overdrive offers music and video. So, when I was down at our, at our Southland meeting, I just thought I'd snaffle their first lot of statistics. Um, so, <coughs> for the 12 libraries in the South Island, it's Invercargill, Buller, Tasman, Nelson, Gray, Westland, Central Table, Queenstown Lakes, Clutha, Ruanui, Nelson, Gore, Marlborough, Southland District Libraries, and Ashburton. Um, in the first five weeks, they checked out 885 ebooks. And I mean, that's virtually no marketing. Um, and so they're pretty pleased with that. And um, the number of ebooks in, in the EPUB format, I talked about those formats earlier, that's the, the most common and easiest. 
um, format, um, 640 ebooks were checked out and 28, no, 175 audio books. So that's, that's just ticking away there and that will become really, really popular. What, what has been noted, of course, is that when um, these libraries signed up to Overdrive, and they were offered based on population a one-time price that they needed to pay and half of that price was um, to be used for credit so they collectively clumped together and with all their credit um, came out bought the the ebooks and the audio books that they have currently got but they had noted already that um, there aren't enough to go around because customers more and more customers will come on and more and more will be frustrated because when you get onto the site, um, it's, it says um, that there's a copy, but it also it's not available, and you, but you, and you can put a hold on. So that's um, I, just having a look. I could see there was quite a few borrowers lined up um, to, with holds already on, on some of these titles. So there is an, something called an advantage scheme, and um, those libraries and that consortia can then turn around and um, purchase books that are only available to their customers in their area. And I think that's probably going to become increasingly attractive. Um, APLE and the Association of Public Library Managers sort of, sort of got this in motion really and um, Overdrive came to the party and agreed that they'd have the South Island Consortia, they'd have an Upper North Island Consortia and a Lower North Island Consortia. And, and everyone in the South Island is pretty pleased because they got it together, got it up and running and the other North Island Consortia haven't got themselves up and running yet so that was a source of pride. Um, so, those consortia, those three consortia don't include Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch which have been doing their own thing for quite some time. Christchurch, for example, has got about 1,600 titles um, with Overdrive and um, yeah, they find it works very well. So, coming down to uh, Wheelers, this is just a test page, I'll have to hurry up, this is just a test page because the Leading Public Libraries is committed to going for wheelers and I think even amongst the staff and in general there's been sort of like why. Um, but we've got, we, we think we've got good reasons to go with wheelers. It's not denigrating overdrive but this just seems to appeal to us a little bit. Number one, it's a um, New Zealand company. Um, number two, I'll, you know, I'll just um, go to the next slide. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through this side by side. Um, so Overdrive's been going forever and you know they're tried and true and they're robust service and they're very professional. Wheelers only launched in, in 2010 so it is a bit of a risk. Um, the Overdrive offers all those options. Um, Wheelers only offers e-books but they do promise to move on to audio books in due course. Um, large subscription base um, for Overdrive. And I, I know that in New Zealand there's Dunedin, there's Timaru, there's Wamaru, there's um, Tauranga, to my knowledge, I think Hutt, there might be a few more um, just interested in, in wheelers. Now, even though, I know when we looked at um, Overdrive years ago, it was so prohibitive we couldn't afford to do it, and certainly the new consortium model made it much more attractive. Um, but the, the wheelers option is a thousand dollar setup cost because they, they set up your own website and they host it and um, and then you purchase each ebook item by item and the difference is and the key difference is that for every issue you pay 24 cents but there's another thing to offset that further down so whereas with overdrive you purchase titles that you don't own them you only have own them as long as you're subscribing to overdrive with with um, wheelers you purchase to own um, there's no consortia options with wheelers at this point. Um, with wheelers, with, with Overdrive, you can't transfer titles to another service. With wheelers, you can. If we got fed up with wheelers, we could take everything we purchased elsewhere. Um, and with wheelers, you can also load ebooks from other places like um, Project Gutenberg. Um, we got to get the thousand ebooks, um, New Zealand ebooks, through the Electronic Tech Centre. Um, other sources. And one of the key things for us, and this is the key, you know, it's a major thing, is this, that Overdrive doesn't, doesn't offer merchant services, whereas um, Wheelers does, and we're keen to replicate our print service in the library so that we can, we can have free titles, but we can also have hot picks titles, so that will allow us to purchase duplicates of the um, 
titles we select for e-books and then make the second and subsequent copies hot things. And we'll get money for that, which is probably $5 to match what we do with our print services. Additionally, um, holds are possible and we'll be able to charge our normal $1 holds fee. So they're expecting to charge a monthly invoice, which we will get, and it will have all our expenditure offset by any revenue that we generate. Um, so, similar in some cases, no one can use a Kindle at this point. The Kindle has now become compatible with Overdrive um, in the States, and that was tweaked to DRM. And they do expect to um, do that in the UK in several months, and Paul's best guess is... About eight, eight months. Yeah, here. maybe eight months we'll have it in New Zealand, so if people have bought candles, maybe they can just put them in the cupboard for, in terms of public library anyway for eight months or so. Um, so we're using the same model, one customer, one use, we haven't got multi-use. And the, uh, what the sticking point for Dunedin, and I mean it's a bit of a frustration, we have to be up by Christmas, is um, the authentication. Um, we've got some in-house issues with the product that we'll use for authentication and we're just going to forge ahead, be up by Christmas, we won't have all the bells and whistles like the merchant services and other bits and pieces, but we'll, we'll get it there for customers. Um, access is through our website and we'll have an icon on the front page of our website. Um, we'll also go in through the digital resources link, click on ebooks, and we'll also get uh, mark records for from Wheelers that will be embedded in our catalogue which um, will allow hyperlink through the 856 field to the um, Wheeler server and into the service. Um, so Mark Records um, available both as sources, perpetual ownership by Wheelers. Um, after checkout, they get what Dylan hasn't decided yet on if they'll do one or I mean two or four weeks loan. Probably because we're not going to have a lot of titles, it'll be the shorter period. After two weeks, the item disappears off the device. Um, so basically, uh, I think that's the end of me. Yes. Um, and so I'll hand over just at this point. Are there any questions in, relate, in relation to um, public library services and e-books? So interested, will um, readers be compatible with Kobo's? Or? Yes. 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 Another thing to look at if anyone's interested, um, Paul has done some great work um, putting a uh, FAQ sheet on the Dunedin Public Library's website which explains an awful lot about files, DRM and the current devices that are most available in New Zealand and while customers may come in and ask us for advice we, we can point them to some factual information but we can't in any way give them a, 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 any sort of directive about which is best to buy. Hi uh, Linda, I just wanted to make a comment about um, Invercargill's Overdrive because we've just purchased the Advantage oh, as well yeah. and we're hopefully going live with that next week. Um, so we're purchasing some YA titles, some children's titles and a little bit of non-fiction to supplement what's on Overdrive and we have been astounded at the response to our um, electronic. We are at the top of the lending stats yeah. and um, so you know, it has been astounding. Oh, no, it's pretty exciting. I mean, I'm not threatened by e-books. I think a lot of people think, oh, but it's just another format. We've got lots of formats, and I think that, you know, from that perspective, it will serve an audience. Just in terms of the face that the public sees, I was playing around with the South Island Library, whatever it is, um, and the publication date of the books that they've got on offer isn't available on that Overdrive site. It's the release date that it's been made available to e e books. Yeah. Does we always have that? Do we? Is there any say in how you can change the face of that catalog record or whatever it is that the public see? So when you're choosing a fiction book, you'd like to know when it's published. Um, I would imagine that things wouldn't be too much different with the wheelers. Um, I can't say for sure because I haven't. I just said this is a bit of a flaw in that system because yeah. you know you mentioned Leslie Pierce. It's really hard to remember which book she wrote first and which yeah, order yeah, it's in. And yeah. you know it's very nice that it says it was released in August 2011, but it really doesn't mean much. I know from the front page you can click in, into greater detail um, whether you might have done that. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't uh, explored that particular issue. Mm. Linda, you mentioned that. Um, 
the reciprocal membership between our districts and regions. So will that mean that Central Otago, Queenstown, Lakes borrowers as optional members of Dominion Public can access wheelers? You're on to them. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting one, isn't it? And the same thing with EPIC, because uh, I know Clotha doesn't buy EPIC, and not that their customers have um, appeared to be bothered by that, but they could if they had a customer or two that were, was particularly interested in EPIC products, they could go via one of the other libraries. Okay, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Where did Barbara come from? <laughs> oh, that public library perspective. I'm here to actually give you a, an academic library perspective on ebooks. Um, first of all, I apologise. The next, two, this slide and the next one, the statistics are in 2009. Um, the way the universities are collecting statistics has changed. Um, but from in 2009. You can see that the New Zealand universities spend on electronic resources was over 66%. Now this includes e-books and e-journals. Um, this is the New Zealand Libra University Library's e-book holdings. Um, we like the slide. It actually shows that we have more e-books in Auckland. <laughs> so that's one that's stuck to me. Um, we actually offer access to over 400,000 e-book titles and have done for some years. Um, Linda had mentioned that e-books became available on CD-ROM in 1992. We actually started getting e-books on CD-ROMs in 1993. Um, and Basically, there was a slow uptake on e-books initially. Um, there was lots of printing restrictions. Um, the high demand material wasn't available. Um, confusing variety of platform. Does this all sound familiar? And the main thing that was slow internet access. And so once we sort of got some of that sorted, um, in about 2003, e-books became available remotely. Now, I mentioned that we have access to over 400,000 titles. I would have liked to have said that most of them are non-fiction, but we actually have some quite large literature collections as well. Um, we have 18th century collections online, which is over 100,000 titles. Early English books online, which again is over 100,000 titles. So the figures are all going up. Literature online. Um, we have reference books and also we have um, subject specific packages. Um, we try to provide access points, multiple access points to all these books. You know, we can't just list 400,000 titles in a big list and hope that people are going to find them. Um, so we get marked records for every ebook we have and we load it into our catalogue. You'll see that we're using the 856 tag to link out. Um, now I'm just using ebook, EBL as an example here. Um, now we get these records, we load these ones once a month I think, once every two weeks. Um, this is our discovery layer. Um, basically um, all our e-books are searchable from within there. We also have an e-book portal so people can search for titles. We actually have an open URL resolver so if people are using Google Scholar and there's a citation for a book, they can actually link to our subscriptions. Um, the e-book library, um, which is one of our main ongoing collections um, and basically we have about 20, over 25,000 titles available from EBL. Um, the reason I chose this one, um, Linda had alluded to patron driven acquisitions and basically we are using EBL for this type of, or this model of purchasing. 
Um, we actually only, I mentioned we had 25,000 titles, we actually only own just over a thousand of those, it's probably more now. And what happens is that um, we have mediated patron driven acquisitions. We make available to our staff and our students those other 25,000 titles. We have selected packages based on subject areas, price, um, date, you know, we want the most recent ones, and we've put the mark records in. Um, people can search for them on the EBL platform, and basically they can then request um, our acquisition staff to actually purchase the material so that they can actually see it. Um, we did start off the trial of it a couple of years ago, and we allowed them to actually um, immediately purchase it if it was within a certain price range. Now it's actually mediated, it goes to staff to actually um, approve it. Um, an email gets sent out to staff, it also becomes about, the request becomes available in an administration portal and the acquisition staff say there's normally a two hour turnaround, maximum two hour turnaround um, for approving a title. So I could search for something on my subject area, say I want to read this book, email gets clipped off and it gets approved and it becomes immediately available to me. Um, there is times when um, a perhaps it's a very specialised subject, perhaps we already have a print version of this title, um, whereby we don't want to purchase it, um, but perhaps we want to make it available on short term loan. So the staff will approve that as well. So it may be just available for one issue for that particular person and then that's it. If you know, someone else wants to read it, then another request has to come through. Um, that short-term loan has sort of become, I was going to say, almost equivalent to an interloan request um, because we can make that available very quickly. Um, I just wanted to mention authentication. Um, all our e-books and e-journals for that um, matter are all authenticated access to. Uh, we control who has access to it. Most of the time it's through IP address. Um, EBL is slightly different because I don't know whether you can see this is me logged in and um, basically it's actually, I've been identified as me. Um, we are pushing through information about each user through to EBL. And so it's identified me by my university username. And as you can see, these are books that I had previously looked at. Um, and it tells me how long ago it was. I like that. 111 weeks ago. <laughs> um, some of these books I don't even remember. <laughs> so obviously I was doing some testing. Um, this is what um, the books look like in EPL, um, and this is me reading it online. Um, you'll see down here, I can see the contents. Um, I see a little bit about the book. Um, book details, it's all there. Um, if I want to download it, I actually require the Adobe Digital Editions that Linda was referring to before. Um, it actually tells me here what happens if I want to loan it. So at the moment it's not out on loan. Um, it tells me how my print allowance and also my copy allowance and also my download allowances. Um, I just want to mention the loan. Um, uh, basically, all of these titles um, are available for as many people who want to read them at the same time. So we have, there's no limit. If all of us decide to read this book today, that's it. You know, we can all do it. So there's no restriction. Um, if I, I can read it online or I can download it, um, we set it up so that the loan length is a maximum of seven days. So I can choose um, how many days I want to read it. And then really I just download it. Oh. Oops, sorry. 
Um, I just wanted to show you this particular book downloaded. So this is this particular book, and this is actually sitting on my laptop at the moment. Um, I have the option to you know, view it differently, different ways. Um, the thing, create bookmarks, I can actually put my own notes into this. Yeah, and just save it so that those are there for the next time that I come in. And you'll see my bookmarks are listed down there. So in effect, what happens is because I've loaned this for seven days, um, it remains here. But after that seven days, I actually don't get access to it anymore unless I re-download. And you'll see that I've obviously downloaded some stuff in the past and they're all sitting there as expired. And I obviously don't know why I have so many versions of this one here, but you'll see that they're all listed as one day. Linda alluded to statistics, um, and on the slide it said something about counter statistics. Um, counter statistics are sort of a, an official standard. They've been around for um, e-journals since 2003, and in 2006 um, the, the counter group put out the standards for um, books and reference works. So this is e-books and e-reference works. Um, there's been a very slow uptake on the publishers actually producing those statistics. Um, I suppose it's just a slow uptake for the e-journal stuff, but it's a lot more accepted now. Um, but what happens is that if everyone is using the same standards for the statistics, it means that then you can compare apples with the apples. You know, if they say, okay, how many successful title requests were there, or how many successful chapter requests were there, we can compare it from platform to platform. So, so it gives us some meaningful statistics once well, every vendor comes to the party. Um, just going on to some of the trends, um, of, as they are now. Um, basically the publishers, from the publisher's perspective, they are publishing ebooks to test the market. Um, if it's successful, you know, then they may go to print or whatever. So that's sort of, you know, I, Linda mentioned the fact that, you know, that the ebook version is normally the last, but sometimes it's actually the other way around, and I think it's going to be increasingly so. Um, bundle packages, you know, this is particularly so with the university, where we will buy a package of titles on um, geography. Now, we may not want all of those titles, but it's actually cheaper for us to do that. Um, move towards more open and standard-based distribution. A comment um, was made um, earlier in the year that basically the e-books market is where the e-journal market was about 10 years ago. Um, the e-journal market is a lot it's more standards based, um, vendors are talking more to each other about software, hardware and all that and so that will happen with the e-books as well. Um, some of the um, publishers are looking at ways to get some money out of everyone. And yes, that's... Sorry? What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, there's the in-book advertising, sponsored links, um, subscription, delivery, <coughs> all you can read. Um, 
you know, well, excuse me, they're a business, they're a these <laughs> Libraries, you know, what's happening is that we're actually needing to adjust to the ever-changing demands and also the technological advances. You know, what happened last year is not what's going to be around next year. Um, from university perspective, you know, we've had ebooks for quite a few years and I suppose we're lucky in that the majority of ours are actually device agnostic. We actually try to ensure that you know, they're going to be downloadable or readable and by however people want to do it. Um, there's the demands for the different lending models, um, simultaneous access, unlimited circulation, I think that's more around the public library. Um, the academic libraries currently have that. More consortium-based approaches, you've seen that now. And the end user, um, what's going to happen is that it's going to be Oh, it's been a mistake. <laughs> um, free or very low priced e-readers. You know, e-reader devices are going to become more and more common and therefore there's going to be pressure both on the publishers and the um, libraries to provide content. Um, social book clubs. Hey, you're no longer going to <laughs> all put <laughs> And Questions? Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> I've been hanging out for this. <laughs> Just um, when you were looking at the book on project management, um, the bookmarking function, and I thought, that's great, but once you've made your little notes in the margin, can you export them before your subscription to the book dies? No. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a waste of time then. <laughs> um, it's interesting because bookmarking while you're online, they remain there. Because you saw my list of books that I had looked at online, so they actually remain there. Um, I haven't actually figured out yet when they drop off the end of my list, how many um, weeks they have to be expired for that year. As far as I know, I can't export them. I will investigate. <laughs> Thank you. Helen, did you find that most of the clients would use um, the electrics are downloading as opposed to a reader um, around the uh, format? Most of the stuff we get access to is actually PDF or EPUB stuff. Um, there is, the academic market isn't producing the Kindle, the formats that go onto the Kindles and things like that. Um, most university people would download two things like um, a laptop or to an iPad or something like that. But because it's a fairly standard file format thing, it's, we normally don't get any problems. We do have some issues every now and again around um, the PDF format, particularly the versions. And um, most of our issues are more around the Adobe digital editions. Um, getting that to work, particularly in a university environment um, where um, one people aren't allowed to download onto their student machines and staff machines and also just ensuring that people do, and, and I suppose because people have roaming profiles, um, the digital editions edition seems to stay on one machine and if you roam somewhere else then you lose it. This is simultaneous access. That's interesting from the point of the public libraries, and I don't know enough about it, you probably know more about it. But the whole point of having a digital thing is that everyone can have it at the same time, and it seems so inane 
that we've got e-books in here and libraries and, and one person's reading it, so I can't. And so how, how what's the high level reason for that from fiction okay. publishers compared with academic publishing? Because mm -hmm. I just don't understand it. I think it's money making. <laughs> you can't get more money, they know how often it's been downloaded. Um, Publishers are effectively protecting their children and they're, 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 they're taking an old print distribution model and trying to apply it to a new world order. Do you think that will change? I think it will change. Um, yeah. Initially, um, academic publishers tried it, um, you know, one issue um, at a time, and the universities just didn't buy it. So, um, so I think the same sort of thing will happen with the public libraries. And I think it is, you know, your 26 issues for the HarperCollins um, titles. If people don't buy them, then they're going to have to relook really at that whole model. I think there are some models in the States where they have not used But also remember that the public library is dealing with a lot of popular fiction stuff, where the university is, it's a lot of specialist non-fiction stuff. But still, with popular fiction, you tend to buy however many copies, thrash them for a yeah. year, get rid of them, whereas e-books, it's yeah. looking like we're just buying one, and it goes out. Well, no, we're, we're oh, we're buying, 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 bu